Good morning and welcome. Uh, it, it's my pleasure to welcome you to uh, this panel, Through the Looking Glass, Corporate Media Criticism and Independent Media Advocacy During the Trump Administration. My name is Andy V. Roth, and I am the Associate Director of Project Censored and the co-editor of Censored 2020 Through the Looking Glass. And it's my pleasure this morning to act as the moderator for this panel. I would like to begin by introducing you to our panelists. Uh, Emil Marmol uh, is at the Institute for Studies in Education at the University of Toronto, where he's a doctoral student. He's currently writing his uh, dissertation, which is an autoethnography testimonio of uh, the experience of growing up the son of Latino immigrants in Orange County, California. To uh, Emil's left is Mickey Huff, the director of Project Censored. Mickey is uh, the co-editor with me of Censored 2020 Through the Looking Glass. He uh, has been busy the past year. He's also the co-author of a new book out from City Lights called The United States of Distraction, which he co-wrote with Nolan Higdon, another Project Censored, long-standing Project Censored uh, contributor. Um, to the left of Mickey is Ken Burrows. Ken is uh, a longtime educator at San Francisco State University, where he is the founding director of uh, the Holistic Health Studies uh, program, and, uh, and also founder and director of the Holistic Health Learning Center uh, there. And he is the anchor of Project Censored at San Francisco State University, which is one of the most uh, robust of the campus affiliates in the project's campus affiliates program. And then to Ken's left is Amber Yang, Yang excuse me, who's a uh, alum of, uh, of both San Francisco State University and the uh, Project Censored program there, where she was co-president of the San Francisco State uh, Project Censored affiliate. Amber. Uh, has worked as a, a paraprofessional for at-risk students with trauma and intensive emotional needs, and she's currently pursuing her master's degree in organization development at Sonoma State University. Um, we are uh, uh, reduced somewhat this morning. We're missing um, uh, Susan Raman and also um, John Collins and his team from The Weave. Um, who unfortunately could not be here on this panel this morning, but we have a great uh, lineup uh, for you. The panelists have agreed this morning uh, to use a somewhat unconventional format. Rather than individual papers, uh, we've prepared a series of questions that each of them in turn will answer and will rotate through these questions. Um, and we'll just, without further ado, I'll get started. Um, so. Uh, each of them will uh, give a response to this question, we'll move to a next question, and then uh, through this organization, I think we'll have plenty of time for question and answer and discussion uh, at the end. Uh, so uh, just by way of, of kind of getting us warmed up and oriented, uh, 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 I'd like to ask each of, each of the panelists to tell us some about um, your contributions to this year's Project Censored Volume, Censored 2020, Through the Looking Glass. Um, and uh, Emil, we'll begin with you. I think we'll just kind of go down the line here, if that's okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah. sure. Uh, so my contribution this year is fake news. Um, the, I can't remember the, <laughs> Trojan horse. Trojan. the Trojan horse for silencing alternative news and um, propping up the uh, corporate news. So um, yeah, the, the chapter has to do with the fact that, you know, fake news is being used to marginalize alternative news. And, um, you know, the, the, the public has been led to believe that the Russians have, you know, completely, inf completely infiltrated our democracy. They've uh, spread, you know, they've, they've tilted the election towards Trump. Um, and. You know what's actually happening is that the social media giants um, are silence, you know, are deplatforming and removing alternative and independent news from their platforms. They're doing it, you know, whole scale and um, uh, wholesale. And and I think what's happening is 
uh, well, beyond that, there's also the fact that Google has changed its search algorithm to remove uh, alternative independent news from you know their search results. Facebook, I mean, there's so many things going on. Facebook is teaming up with the Atlantic Council, the NED, the NDI, the IRI. I think I'm getting those acronyms correct. Um, but um, and then they're teaming up with the corporate news sector to prop them up, you know, to provide news through their, you know, uh, social networking sites to uh, fill newsrooms with, you know, journalists paid for by Google and, um, you know, all the other large corporate media firms. So, um, you know, and what what I see what I see is happening is um, using the fake news scare, much like so many other things are done, you know, to the public, you know, first there's like the fear of communism, there's the fear of terrorism, then there's the fear of the Russians, you know, it's such a like corporate onslaught of this, like all of a sudden this panic that people don't even have the time to think about it. They just automatically believe what they're told and then there's no critical thinking and no time to even, because it's such an onslaught of information being thrown at the public by the corporate news, there's no time to actually digest it and take a step back and think, well, what's actually really happening? And what's happening is that those in power, political and economic elites, are doing the very best that they can to eliminate dissent in whatever form they see it. So uh, if, if, there's, if there's a website, if there's uh, you know, uh, a web page or a, you know, a group on Facebook or any, anything at all that attacks or is critical of you know, the status quo or <coughs> the powers that be, then these, this kind of like, you know, conglomeration of, of powers, be, you know, the social media giants, the corporate news giants, the government itself, are, are doing everything they can to marginalize dissent. And to a certain extent, they're, they're getting away with it. You know, sometimes they, um, you know, the pushback is so strong that the alternative news sites or whatever sites that they remove get reinstated, but oftentimes they don't. For instance, Venezuela analysis and Tell us who they got put back up, but it's going to reach a point, I think, where um, you know these news organizations, these political groups, uh, these social movements are not going to have the space online to discuss their viewpoints, their information, because they will eventually be marginalized. I think right now we're just at a, at a juncture where they're testing this out, and they're kind of like seeing how how the public's going to take this, and then move forward with it. So, yeah. Well, Mickey, I'm yeah. gonna slightly redirect uh, the question to you because not only right. are you the co-editor of, of the Censored Gear book, but you also host the Project Censored radio show. And so I, I uh, especially for some of the questions uh, uh, on the subsequent rounds of today's mm -hmm. panel, um, it will be relevant for people to know a little bit not only about your role in the book, but also uh, your role as the host of the radio show. Right, so um, thanks so much, Andy. Um, uh, I've done, um, been doing the Censored Yearbook since 2010, uh, sorry, 2009, um, as a editor, co-editor, and uh, been doing that with Andy Roth here uh, since 2012. And so Andy and I have done a number of, of these books together, and um, I'm gonna skip over to the radio segment of some of the other things we do here in just a second, but just wanted to, to remind you that uh, the things that we are talking about today are right here in, their, in our new book, in Cesar 2020. Emil, uh, his chapter is chapter eight. Um, so the acronyms and some of the things he was talking about, that's all explained in here in detail. And, um, and then of course, Ken and Amber are gonna talk about their chapter. Uh, in, in the book and uh, there's a lot of other chapters other than the top 25 censored stories and Andy and I have worked over the last several years to really branch out our network of interested people and to try to really diversify and, and really, it really has I think um, really made the book even, even more robust and, and more informative than it already had been historically. So segueing from that, um, the, the Project Censored, while it was founded in 1976 at Sonoma State University, uh, over the years, founded by Carl Jensen, then handed over to the sociologist Peter Phillips. Um, and in 2010, Peter Phillips and I sort of took, we were aiming and taking the project in, in a little broader direction. Um, we helped launch the validated independent news program that Andy Roth runs and, and does to work on multiple campuses, 
especially San Francisco State, but also 20 campuses basically on and off around the US. And one of the other things we launched right then was something called the Project Censored Show. So rather than only have the annual book that comes out every year, um, you know, and often we'd get emails and people would contact us and they would say, well, the book is great, it's every year, but you know, stuff happens every week, um, you know, every day, you know, and of course we're in the 21st century. Um, and so Adam Armstrong, our webmaster, really helped up our game online and we were posting things year round and Peter and I got this opportunity at the very historic KPFA, the uh, flagship station of the Pacific Radio Network that's in Berkeley, California, founded in 1949. Um, and we got an invitation to do a morning uh, drive time program, an hour long public affairs radio program. I know nowadays all the hip kids call things, everything a podcast, um, but and, uh, podcasts are fantastic and they give people so many opportunities to express themselves and do uh, various things to get information out that otherwise you would not hear in the corporate media at all. And, of course, Emil's chapter addresses some of those issues. Um, but what Peter and I did is that we started covering hard-hitting, uh, underreported issues every week. And we did it. Um, it. It's sort of in a format of, of NPR, uh, where is, uh, whereas you know, we have guests and you know, we do quarter, you know, quarterly breaks through the hour. Uh, the, the thing about Pacifica, however, that uh, is diff very different than both commercial and public radio NPR model is that it's all community support. It's all community radio. So it was a real great segue you know, for the project because the project is completely community-based and it's run by a nonprofit, the Media Freedom Foundation. And so Peter and I did the radio, we started doing the radio every week, and Anthony Fest, our producer, um, all volunteer, by the way, right? There's no pay in any of this. In fact, we raise money for the station uh, and other stations. Um, but it also gave the project a bigger platform. You know, and it made it really, um, it really helped us reach broader audiences, including people that never heard of us, um, right, but it, it became sort of a mainstay for a lot of folks. And Peter and I, um, you know, we, we like to, we like to joke, and of course we sometimes joke about things that are stressful uh, to relieve them. But Andy Roth always reminds me, um, you know, he's like, you know, we do events every year, and sometimes we do multiple events during the year, but when you're doing a radio show, it's really kind of like doing an event every week. Um, because you've got guests, and you've got to prepare, and you're trying to get as many different things on the program as you can. And of course, everybody here has been on the show. Uh, Emil's going to be on the show really soon. Um, if you're interested at all, I know that there's a lot of stuff going on today. And uh, I'll actually be on another panel uh, and, and later this afternoon here. Uh, but the program airs in Berkeley on 94.1 FM, and it's on Fridays at 1 p.m. So today, it's on. Earlier in the week, Andy and I pre-recorded a show talking about Facebook's partnership with corporate media um, with, with um, sort of a burying, burying the hatchet, so to speak, um, and furthering along what Emil's chapter actually talks about, um, how Facebook is teaming up with corporate media to marginalize uh, alternative and independent voices. And so that's, that's, again, what Project Censored has championed for over 40 years. That's what we continue to champion every week on the radio. Um, and again, if you're interested in learning more about that or you know people that want to come on or you yourself want to come on and be interested in you know, be part of what, what's going on there, uh, I'd urge you to contact us through the projectcensored.org website. Um, and uh, the last thing I wanted to say about the radio, again, is it's, again, a team effort. Um, there's also a spin-off podcast that, that, uh, and, uh, that um, Nolan Higdon and Nick Baham do. Uh, it's called Along the Line, so we actually have that on the projectcensored.org site, too. Um, and, of course, the project also has forayed into several different movies, including a recent one on fake news. So um, sort of my role here today was simply to kind of broaden, broaden that horizon, at least in part, to let people know that the project censored is, is way more than, than just the annual book and the top stories. It's a curriculum. It's a critical pedagogy. It's a radio show. It's a podcast. It's a film. Um, and uh, we do go out in the community and do a lot of events and workshops and so forth. So uh, we're, just, we're just happy to be able to keep doing this, happy to co-sponsor this event uh, here this weekend with the Union for Democratic Communications. And uh, with that, I'll just pass it over here uh, to Ken and Amber. So thanks so much. Great. And I can move so you can use your... Absolutely. Yeah. Just gonna be brief. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Nice to see you all. <laughs> 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 oh, really. <laughs> Uh, good to be here, and it's so interesting to me to see how these ideas that you chew on for months and years at a time, and, and we have events like this to somehow share them, so uh, 
Thank you for that opportunity. Um, so our, our focus is a bit different than I think the other chapters in the book and if we go back to the book as, as a focus. Um, our chapter is the last chapter in our, in our new book and I'm, I'm proud of my students to be a, a part of this unfolding uh, media literacy handbook every, every year or for years. Um, this, this particular uh, slice of the pie, we, we focused on something uh, different. Uh, we've called this in our chapter, uh, Our Collective Crisis um, and Constructive Journalism. How do we grow the good and the possible? And uh, Project Center is known for talking about junk, uh, junk news and news abuse, you know, for two very important aspects of critical media literacy. And so we'll get uh, to including that in a more direct way and the whole idea of a truth emergency. We're not getting the truth we need. Fake news is now commonly known and talked about. But we're suggesting there's, there's the third news problem. We're calling this the, the negative um, news overload. And so this, this third news area has uh, been left out of our discussion in a full way. And so we'd like to highlight that and talk about why this third area of, uh, of the news crisis is really uh, should be foregrounded and talked about more. Uh, so I'm going to talk first, and then, of course, Amber will follow up. So uh, we have a slide, which I guess is already behind us here. Uh, we suggest that there is a, a collective crisis that we're in. And uh, the signs are everywhere. We have a fragmented society. We have, uh, we're unable to, to solve our growing problems. Um, we basically have a shared crisis that's twofold. First, a crisis of disconnection. We're not connected to each other like we used to be. That crisis is both social and environmental. And uh, also, it's secondarily a crisis of impaired imagination. We really aren't thinking well about our situation. We feel disconnected and we feel unable to grasp in a way what's going on. And so this third, there's a third crisis that drives this impaired imagination. And that is the, basically the crisis we're finding in the news and the media system. And it has a lot to do with also the digital revolution that's destroying the very web that we've known in the past of how to think about what news even is. So, but underlying all of this, as we suggest, is this negativity bias. That we, we've evolved to be fearful as people. Um, it's helped us uh, and keep, uh, kept our ancestors alive. <laughs> we've had to be threat aware. Right now, if that door is to open, watch our heads turn. It's something called the orient orienting reflex in biology. So we naturally will just check out, are we okay? And we do it so quickly, we don't even notice, right? So it's, under, it's automatic for us. It is literally how we organize our perception, which is a big part of what we want to talk about. And so our minds uh, and our behavior are shaped by, by threats, real and unreal. So basically, we notice if you follow this tree of, of thinking down, we're more prone to negative stimuli than we are to positive ones. We, our attention is drawn, literally, as you can see, we're, we're set up to uh, uh, our whole nervous system. Two-thirds of our nervous system, and, uh, at least within the amygdala, that alarm center of the, the brain, this neocortex, this, this evolutionary, evolutionary factor that really is defined us in a way as being human, uh, is really set up to respond to threat. And so, and as we do this, we look for the bad news. That's our orientation. And in doing so, that we have two core perceptual mistakes. We tend to um, overestimate threats and under, underestimate resources and possibilities. So given that that is our bias, we suggest this is not just a you and me issue. It is our collective issue. It is a collective crisis. And journalism, journalism is not separate from this reactive uh, orientation to the world. Um, so we suggested three aspects to the, uh, to, uh, to the news crisis. Problem-focused news versus a possibility-focused news, which we want to talk more about, and journalism. That, so where's the empowering news that highlights human goodness, creativity, and possibility? Where is that news? And then sec the second part of this today's news crisis is access to responsible news is in decline, as we've heard. Um, and trust in journalism is at an all-time low. Uh, a recent uh, Reuters poll, 2017, suggested that 
less than half of the people um, around the globe that trust um, media. And in this country, it's actually uh, across 36 countries they surveyed. And it's, it's around um, even less than in our own country. And just to, to finish up, the third part of the news crisis, uh, what is the news in this new digital era? How do we define the news? Uh, what are the ethics that really set up what news will be? What platforms do we turn, turn to to find our news? How will this news be gathered and distributed so that we can all know that's where we turn to for something we find is safe? And then in a moment, we'd like to talk further about this uh, cycle of disconnection and impaired imagination that is part of our argument. Mm -hmm. About the social and imaginal crisis, we'll come back to that. Okay. All right. Are you, are you? Yeah, yeah. You're going. Is that a, is that? Yeah. Right? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so just to continue off what he's saying, we're we were thinking like this is a clear issue in all aspects of life. Um, but you know, how do we how do we shape our journalism and media to support an integrative news model where we're not just talking about the problems? So and we're not just getting caught in this cycle of um, cynicism and disengagement that can happen when there's a negative news overload. So um, we had a we cited a story um, that was saying that we're living in a time where there's a huge hope gap. Um, there's a lot of threats and there's no uh, not a lot of efficacy of response. And this can really lead to disengagement. This can really lead to fatalism, right? Feeling like we're helpless in a way. Um, and so, you know, people my age often are like, I don't even want to read the news. I don't want to even watch the news anymore because it's too overwhelming for me, right? And an NPR and Harvard study show that a quarter of those polled said that the news was one of their biggest stressors. So it's probably no surprise for all of us to hear that. So we're thinking, how do we set up a journalism model that isn't just about the problems? It incorporates the problems, but it isn't just about it. So we thought of a metaphor, a three-legged metaphor, um, tripod, where um, the critical journalism is that stabilizing centerpiece. You know, without that, we need to be aware of the threats. We need to be aware of public concerns. We need to be aware of um, abuses of power, systems of power, um, injustice in our world. We need to have that healthy skepticism, and we need to think critically about our own media diet. You know, and what's in the frame, how it got there, what's left out, who's benefiting from the news we're seeing, right? We all need to be aware of that. But also, we also need to be looking at constructive ways of looking at what we're seeing. So we call it constructive journalism, where it's not just problem focused, it's possibility focused. So um, we broke that down into two forms. Solutions journalism is the first one, where we focus on innovation. Highlights design thinking for problem prevention, reduction, or elimination. Um, we define it as also systemic creative strategies that empower communities and individuals, shift public discourse, and address social challenges, realizing that seeing problems is not enough. And there's a lot of people right now, <clears throat> excuse me, that are doing great things. And that's often underreported on. That's not, and a lot of reforms go unrealized. A lot of them don't reach their fullest potential. So just imagining a world where our journalism and media can really highlight and foreground the people that are doing amazing things, right? So um, um, the next one we have is engagement journalism. So this is our last leg. And this is really about media and journalism that highlight people coming together on matters of common interest. So it's not necessarily like critical media and solutions journalism, which are finding solutions or addressing problems. It's actually foregrounding stories of people coming together and making a difference and realizing that that isolation social crisis has to do with us not engaging. So John A. Powell, the director of the Haas Institute for a Fair and Inclusive Society said that, um, he told Brian Edwards Teeker, is that his name, um, on KPFA, like, what gives you hope, John A. Powell? And he was just like, well, I don't organize around hope. I don't organize around despair. I organize to engage. Um, and just that engagement is something that we're really missing nowadays. I mean, you go to SF and it's dead quiet on the bus, on the streets. Even if people aren't even looking at their phones, we're just not talking to each other. So this last leg is really about um, awakening our connection and doing it through use of various tools. So we have a list of tools um, 
We think part of that means, um, engagement means foregrounding public space, collective gathering. Um, foregrounding the power of the arts and how we tell stories and what we tell stories about, that the arts are infused. Um, and then the power of play and humor and storytelling and symbols. So these are all tools that we want to be using to awaken the connections that we all have. And, and the media um, system that really carries these. Mm -hmm. Yes. So with that being said, I think we want to stop there for yeah. now. Fantastic. So we're going to be now building and deepening on these themes through subsequent rounds of, of uh, the presentation. Uh, and I'm going to ask our panelists for the sake of time and for preserving uh, time for discussion um, to be a little more succinct in the next round um, now that we've got a big picture. So the theme of our session is corporate media criticism and independent media advocacy during the Trump presidency. Um, and as we know, the president regularly villainizes the U.S. press as the enemy of the people. And so I'm at wanting to hear from each of uh, the panelists, uh, based on your experience and your work, um, what are your, feeling, what are your uh, recommendations on the most effective way you engage in criticism of corporate news without inadvertently aligning with uh, a president who clearly fails to grasp the role of a free and independent press for a democratic society? And again, that's a big question I'm gonna ask each of you to answer um, in a succinct way with the idea that we're going to open it up for a fuller discussion and there'll be opportunities to elaborate on the main points you're making now. Okay. Neil, check up. Yeah. Uh, so, it's a controversial thing to say, but, and I was going to have a paper, you know, present a paper at a conference I was thinking about calling it uh, Correct Conclusion, false premises, uh, and you know, talking about Trump calling the corporate news fake news. Like, I think, in a sense, he's right. They are, the corporate news is, by and large, a form of uh, getting out, you know, the ruling class propaganda. But he's wrong. When his, his premises are wrong because he calls them fake news because when he finds that he doesn't agree with what they're saying or what they criticize him. That's not what makes them fake news. It's something else. Um, and again, you can't dismiss all corporate news and all articles and everything as being totally fake news. I mean, that's also, and, and you can't also dismiss or be okay with Donald Trump, uh, you know, undermining the pillar of, of a free press in society. Um, but, you know, so, so how, do you, how do you walk that fine line? Um, you know, something else that I'm seeing and that, that, that I'm afraid of is that by Trump vilifying the corporate press, people are knee-jerk now defending the corporate press that has been, you know, deceiving them for so long. Um, and also, like, holding up figures of authority that, you know, before, especially on the left, that they would have said, like, these people don't deserve to be, you know, uh, supported like Mueller, like now he's some kind of hero. Um, so you know, I, I think I think critical media literacy is the way to kind of you know guide people to understanding. And I you know can't get into what critical media literacy is at the moment, but instilling in people the the tools by which they can you know um, decipher the news for themselves. Um, and you know. I, and you know, just to, just to talk about the corporate media for a second. I mean, you know, what what do I do? I mean, I talk to my students. I talk to people. I say, you know, for instance, uh, look at the way Venezuela was vilified it, it, with its democratically elected government and this, like, you know, Juan Guaido, who declared himself president, you know, out of nowhere. It's, it's nobody. And then on the other hand, you've got Chile, you know, a friendly nation state to the U.S., who's repressing its people killing and raping its people, and the corporate media is relatively silent compared to Venezuela. So you've got this total double standard. And I mean, I can make so many examples, but um, I think it's just a matter of, of doing what we can as educators and not putting ourselves, you know, hopefully not putting ourselves on a pedestal, but, you know, I think a lot of people do need help in, in kind of understanding what the media does to us and kind of, you know, uh, Give, again, instilling the tools in them to figure this out for themselves. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, build, building on uh, what Emil uh, said, um, 
you know, I, I, I teach about this and talk about this in public a lot, and Andy and I have written about this a lot, and it, it's exactly the case uh, that when Trump is referring to the, to the news media as the enemy of the people, while that has really eerie echoes going all the way back to Kaiser Wilhelm and World War I and Hitler and World War II in Germany, you know, those were very well-worn phrases to demonize uh, the press. I mean, so again, um, you know, when Trump is invoking those things, there, there, there's more to the rhetoric than just the surface of it. Um, it and it's also a, a negative virtue signaling <laughs> Uh, to various groups, right? And it's kind of a nod and a wink to seeing what you, what can we get away with. Um, so, it, it, specifically in the books, you know, and, and on the radio, uh, where we do this more weekly, we're really careful to talk about why the corporate media has an agenda that is hostile to the public interest. But, and we can talk about that, and we can unpack that, and we can be very specific and factual about that, where we don't rest on repeating phrases like enemy of the people or fake news ad infinitum, because that kind of fuels those ideas out there in the world that people glom onto. And unfortunately, I think a lot of people glom onto them out of necessity because they, they hear them all the time. They're ubiquitously used, and so people try to wrap their heads around them. But because we don't have an educational system in the United States, and I would argue that we don't have a corporate media that has an intent or has an, a didactic intent, um, I think a lot of people are, are kind of left in the dark uh, about, I mean, you'll mention critical media literacy, right? And when you saw the slide up here with Amber and Ken about constructive media literacy, uh, critical journalism and critical media literacy is one of the three legs of the tripod. Right? It's an integral component of that. And so um, when we talk about how the press is not serving in the public interest, we show, of course, also on one hand, how the establishment, whether, it's, um, whether it is Trump or others, and there are many others, who demonize the press, when, while that happens, we want to call out that their purposes for doing it are mostly ideological or to score political points. Mm -hmm. They're not to deconstruct in a way so that the public is aware that they're being misled or misinformed in a ritual way. And so what we try to do in the books is we try to be very careful about how we use language, how we talk about those issues, and on the radio, likewise. Um, and and uh, just today, again, at 1 o'clock, Andy and I are talking, pre-recorded, of course. <laughs> um, uh, but we're getting into that, about how Facebook and the corporate media are trying to sort of lay claim to what news ownership is. And, but, but a lot of this is fighting back against the rhetoric of Trump. But in the process, they're actually also producing propaganda and disinformation to silence the critical voices that really are a free press. And so Andy and I wrote, um, real quick, finishing up, uh, we wrote an op-ed when this started going on in spades, right? In the 2018 book, in the introduction, we talked about this at length, by the way. Um, and um, we came to the defense of Jim Acosta at CNN, and we came to the defense of people in the corporate media, and, and some of our you know, supporters were like, hey, wait a minute, you, you criticize them all the time. And I'm like, yes, but we criticize them for the right reasons <laughs> and for factual reasons based on the public interest, not to score points. And so, at any rate, yeah. I turn it over to Ken and Yeah, Ken. so Ken and Amber, I think, um, I think there's some obvious answers, uh, but tell us some about how the constructive journalism model mm -hmm. provides uh, you know, I don't know what the right imagery is, uh, counterweights, counterbalance to the kind of the, 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 the Trump criticism of enemy of the people and, uh, you know, a press that can't be trusted, right? How do, how do these things square with a constructive journalism um, framework? Um, when I think of Trump, his election is clearly a, an anti-establishment vote. Right. So he, he brought in segments of the culture that already recognized that neoliberalism has failed, has failed us. And so there's a whole a series of a collection of different subgroups uh, involved. And I, I used to do therapy. I had a private practice for years, and I, I did hypnosis as part of that. And I noticed that um, uh, you pace, pace, pace before you ever leave. And so you, you, you before you, if you're with a client, so you're, trying to match the reality system. 
And so Trump was speaking to us, you know. He, I remember a number of things he stated. We should investigate 9-11. That's never been approached. We should. And he had a series of finger pointings and that, oh, that's interesting. The establishment isn't talking about that. So that's pacing with that, those subgroups, right? And so that, I, I thought just to know He's astute enough in his analysis of the fragments of culture that are dissatisfied and not being fed by good news to organize some of them through this interesting approach. Yet, if we were to step into our chapter and look at this a little more closely, uh, I don't think people are apathetical at all. We, we just don't have the information we need. Now, some of that is, is uh, through critical media. We, we, we lack the information. I mean, one of our quotes in our chapter is, on the news crisis that's feeding the crisis of imagination is, is that uh, FCC reports we need at least 50,000 reporters doing investigative reporting around the country. We don't, we have less than half of that now with the declining of one on five newspapers closing all of that. So the, the decline of actual news gathering and with that their, uh, their news deserts literally that are happening especially in local areas where news is to be present but those organizations have collapsed that allows the rise of these alternative mm -hmm. formats. But also, if we think about not apathetical as far as people, we need to be given information about how to solve the problems we're hearing about, right? Yeah. That's in part why we're apathetical. It's just coming at us all the time, and it's overwhelming. So if you have news including problems in the independent press, uh, not help, helping us tag on, here's what you can do, you know, if you'd like to help with this problem, right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, um, Yeah. when I think of like corporate media and corporate news, I think of my parents watching Fox and CNN, and I was just at their house like a month ago. And just like, you know, like they're saying ridiculous things. It's just a lot of entertainment, lots of bread and black and white flashing. And um, just like, you know, my parents aren't even really reacting, right? They're not like, oh, this is stupid. And they're not like, oh my God, look at what CNN's saying, right? It's more of like, I just was watching them. And they resemble a lot of people where corporate media often just makes people passive consumers. People are just kind of just like, oh, okay, oh. <laughs> and it just becomes this cycle of that passivity. So when I think about your question, I think of like my experience with the news I wrote um, for Project Censored, and um, I was so blessed that three of my stories, last book, got voted into the top 25 and censored. And all three stories were constructive stories. All of them were really showing that not even just corporate media, but independent platforms is a lot about problems. It's a lot about like, the world sucks, this is what's happening. And then, oh, look at this, this is happening too. And oh, we should all be angry, we should all be afraid, which definitely has truth. But you know, what is it like to you know, have something in the news about how internet co-ops are coming around in the city, building their own internet to fight net neutrality? Um, what about this idea that we can actually extract carbon from the air and put it back into our soil where it actually belongs, and it can reverse a lot of the issues happening with our climate right now? You know, so um, when I think of that, I just think of our constructive media model is really about um, showing the other piece of the picture, right? So it's not just the problems. Okay, final question, and then we will open up for uh, your questions and observations. Um, obviously, uh, a, a critical take on today's corporate news doesn't end with the Trump White House. Uh, or some of the issues we've been discussing. We also know that corporate giants like Google, Facebook, Twitter are also playing a key role. Um, again, drawing on the insights of your own work, I'd like each of you to respond quickly, uh, uh, perhaps not in, in, in the fullness that we could address these issues, uh, about how to support independent news media uh, when social media giants like Facebook and Google appear intent on throttling uh, public access to these uh, uh, independent news sources, how do we, that, especially independent news sources that challenge official narratives. Big question, a little time. Let's uh, do a quick go through and then we'll open up and uh, continue the discussion more widely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, I think, that, I think that can be fairly quick. Um, first of all, I think it's important to get out to everybody you know sources of alternative media that you trust. Mm -hmm. People don't know, not enough people do know, but not enough people know about good quality alternative media. Mm -hmm. Then 
donate, give them money because they can't function without money. Um, so just get the word out. You know, I, I drop you know all the sites that I like on people all the time. I post on God forbid Facebook, donate, mm -hmm. donate to this list because I just did. Mm -hmm. um, also, uh, given that Facebook and Google are throttling and eliminating, disappearing this, these news sources, so sign up for their newsletters. Mm -hmm. uh, connect directly to them rather than utilizing like these like uh, middle people. Um, also, don't use Google. Like you don't have to use Google. There's DuckDuckGo, and I was surprised. I told my students, I'm not even thinking about. It. I was like Google. I was like, wait, don't Google it. <laughs> Search for it on the internet. Uh, and I said personally, I use DuckDuckGo, and I thought some students giggle. But some students were like, oh yeah, we use DuckDuckGo. I was like, great, use DuckDuckGo. And I went into a spiel about how Google, what Google's doing, and they're like, no way, man. And so, um, you know, so, so this was good, right? You just have to talk to people. That's great. Um, and then, you know, beyond that, get off Facebook. I haven't yet. I probably will soon switch over to Minds. Apparently, Minds is a great other social networking site you can go to. But we're just so stuck on Facebook, we can't pull away. We pull away from them. At the same time, though, like I, I, I don't want to just push like individual neoliberal solutions. Like, meaning, what I mean by that is like it's all on the individual. There needs to be structural change. Like, yeah. these organizations need to be uh, broken up, uh, perhaps put in, in the public, in the public, in the hands of the public. Um, but then again, how do you do that? And this is a whole other discussion because the the power and wealth is so concentrated right now mm -hmm. that you know. I agree with, I think it's Gillens and Page, that like we don't have, the, the populace doesn't really have any power through voting. I think, I think the time where like, voting for people was gonna make a change is kinda done. I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna you know, advocate any particular sort of, level, sure. right? Mm -hmm. Exactly, on the federal level. On the local level, it's, there's more, but, uh, more potential, but I, I think we have to figure out a way to, and I don't wanna say anything particularly dangerous here, but, to strip those who have power and wealth of that power and wealth. Because you know, it, it was uh, Judge Brandeis, uh, Supreme Court, who said you can either have democracy or you can have great wealth. But you can't have both. Because great concentrated wealth is, is inimical to democracy. So, you know. Anyway. Yeah, in, in interest of brevity to, to hear, hear you all, I uh, clearly echo uh, what Emil just said, and not just with Facebook and Google and so forth, but we should also be breaking up PG and E, uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. given that we're yeah. here in California, yeah. in the Bay Area. Yeah. Um, and again, I couldn't agree more. And I will have to give a shameless plug as president of the Media Freedom Foundation, nonprofit, and director of Project Censored. One of the things we do is we try to get out to the public as many of these different independent and alternative news sources as, as we can that we champion in the first chapter of the book every year. Because we do get that question all the time when we speak places. People are like, well, where do you get news information? Where do you get your news? Who do you trust? Um, and I can never answer that question succinctly because as soon as I mention someone that I do, I'll think of 10 reasons why I disagreed with something else that they did. Mm -hmm. or, and so I don't like to get wrapped up in the branding issue of sort of like this Amy Goodman all, the, all day. Um, because then I can go and talk about Syria and Libya, and I would say not, not Amy Goodman all day. Um, <laughs> exactly. But you get, you get the picture, mm -hmm. right? But what I think is, is that like the, the, what's also behind critical media literacy education is be having a vast array of awareness mm -hmm. of where sources are, and if, you, if people have general and basic critical thinking skills, they will start to go out and look for them on their own. And so I do advocate, like I'm on Facebook and the rest of these, but I, I, it's the same thing. Um, I, I'm gonna tell you, you should turn corporate media off. <laughs> but I'm, I'm a hypocrite because I don't turn it off because I, I, I watch it so that I can understand what it's doing right. and writing about it. And I'm actually on Facebook for a lot of the same reasons, yeah. right? So again, I would say get off the gig. Uh, Andy, what's the name of that book? The ten reasons or ten to, to delete all your social media accounts right now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, right and here. It, yeah. It, it looks like a primer in mental health civility yeah. <laughs> in a lot of ways. But yeah. but anyway, I'll just wrap up by saying um, 
you know, if you go to the projectcensored.org website and look at the top stories that we do every year all the way back to 1976, you'll see a vast array of people that are really doing public interest journalism. And we need to support those. You heard what Ken said. You know, the FCC says we need 50,000 journalists running around helping tell us what to do, and we now have half that. But I would argue that if we start adding up the citizen journalists and the other people doing public community radio and all these other kinds of work, we do have people doing it. They just lack the massive platforms that the money yes. builds for them. Yes. Right. And what we need to do is we need to really get a public trust going where instead of billions of dollars flowing into the dividends uh, uh, out to investors and other people at Alphabet, the head company of Google or, or, or pg and &E for that matter, right? Public power, public media, right? We, we could do this. Mm -hmm. But I think as Emil suggested that the time to influence it on the federal level, um, I think that time is, is, is it, it's passing us. Mm -hmm. And so we really need to do grassroots, bottom-up efforts, that, as Amber was saying, uh, like in the city with people doing things with net neutrality and these kind of things. So I think there's a lot of hope and a lot of promise. I just think that we need to remind each other of those things, and, and not just in word, but in action, and the people we interact with every day. So. Ken and Amber, I'll, mm -hmm. I'll ask you to uh, respond, but perhaps share the allotted time, if that's OK, because yeah, yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm aware of yeah. uh, I'm yeah. sure there's a lot of wisdom and insight uh, in, uh, among our uh, audience today, too, and I want to open up. Yeah. Um, I think the major crisis you pointed out, I would frame it slightly different, differently. Uh, there's money power and there's people power. And so we're lacking, we have, a, we have a crisis in the news, not just because we lack a business model for mm -hmm. corporate news, which we hear all the time, we need a new business model. <laughs> yeah. That's not, that's not going to apply. We, we do. We need to expand what news is. We need to really understand a whole different model for what news is. We're suggesting it needs to be news that actually helps us uh, break through this crisis of both imagination and disconnection. Mm -hmm. And so we have engagement media, and we have a wonderful slide if you have to. Let me finish no. the, the point, but I'll pass it. Okay. Oh, wait, we might. I, I just think she's got a great slide. She's got her. Mm -hmm. It shows people being engaged around an issue right. Right, as a way of closing. So I think unless we start feeling connected, we're lost. Mm -hmm. Right? And facts alone are not going to do it. That's, that's how we finish the chapter. Mm -hmm. we, need a, we, need a, a, we need a new narrative you're saying. I need, we, we need new storytelling. Mm -hmm. We need new ways of telling a story, and they're not just fact-based. Uh, we, we need to feel we're part of something. What is our shared moral story here? So the news crisis is part of this, but we need the kind of news that actually helps us connect with each other. Yeah, just to be you can show this. Um, yeah, and you know, uh, I really like this one project called Movement Journalism. It's in the South, and it's basically local. It's a local um, organization that are really trying to publish game-changing news around stories of people trying to build collective power and organizing together to make fundamental shifts in the power dynamics of our society. So, um, yeah, do you want to show it? Yeah, I would have, yeah, yeah. Maybe just when we finish. Okay. Um, so really, like, examples of social engagement are everywhere, but like this movement journalism said, it's a movement that doesn't know it's a movement. So how do we foreground that? So, you know, just to even add, um, the, five, the five questions we see in journalism is who, what, where, when, why. And we're offering another W of what's possible now. And so what, what would it be like if stories ended around um, with open questions or ideas about learning curves or visions for the future? And sometimes our stories end with like a everything sucks kind of mindset, right? So, you know, Yes Magazine. I really enjoy Yes Magazine. They often do um, stories about um, worker-owned co-ops, public banking, public commons, local food systems, um, really great values. Um, Truth Out just did an amazing article about alternatives to policing for community health and nonviolence. It really was a great article. Um, Solutions Journalism Network has an article about 72 places to find solution story ideas. Um, and Common Dreams just did one on 117 rights groups offer roadmap to transform U.S. criminal legal system. So it's really opening that imagination up to um, what we also need to be looking into about what's possible. Uh -huh. so, yeah. And can we show that picture just to yeah. finish? Uh, sure. 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 You know that again, there's people power and money power, and as it gets more and more concentrated in one direction around money, why not shift in the other direction to the kind of media that's going to support us? 
don't know the password. Oh, there's a block to sound from us. We got a great picture, but we may not be able to show it unless we can pass it. No, yeah, maybe. Well, too bad. Thank you to each of our panelists, and we'd like to now open up with your uh, insights, your observations, your questions. We'll be glad to uh, do our best to be in dialogue with you now. Well, thank you, uh, gentlemen, and this young lady. Uh, I think uh, I learned much more, uh, much about this topic. And I, uh, my name is Jin Long Zhang. I'm a Chinese. Uh, I have an English name, Robin. You can call me Robin. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, uh, so I'm a visiting scholar at uh, University of the Pacific. Uh, I stay here for one year, and uh, I went back to China at January 2020. Uh, so I, uh, I'm very interested about the topic of uh, fake news, and I have a, a question on, that, on this topic. A uh, few days ago, maybe a few weeks ago, I noticed that there is a, a very interesting news. Uh, you know, Facebook CEO Zuckerberg rejects um, to uh, shut down the Trump's social media. Uh, we know that because there is a very interesting thing. Uh, uh, Trump calls CNN, uh, uh, New York Times, uh, Fox News as fake news. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, uh, many people, especially uh, uh, Democrats, call uh, think, think Trump uh, Twitter's many fake news every day. So uh, I think uh, one word about different fake news. It's very interesting. And uh, so um, some people, uh, like uh, uh, Kamala Harris, you know, yeah, uh, she, uh, he calls me, uh, he calls to shut down the Trump's social media, uh, just, just as I uh, say just now. Uh, uh, Zach Berger rejects to shut down Trump's social media. Uh, because I think uh, users should uh, uh, users should uh, 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 responsible for what uh, they think what is true or what is news fake news. So I want to know uh, what's your idea on this topic. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, look. If, if your question is, you know, do we shut down? people's, you know, social media accounts. I, yeah. If that's the question, I think that's a terrible idea. Mm -hmm. oh. I mean, sure, I think that the things that Trump spouts are absurd and hateful and terrible. But I mean, you could just as easily make the argument, and I wouldn't make this argument, that Kamala Harris should have her account. I mean, she says absurd things as well. She said that the Copernic, you know, scandal was instigated by the Russians, which is absolute nonsense. I mean, it's rubbish, right? Like, there's no evidence whatsoever to, to, to prove such a thing. It's just, that, I mean, we've reached the state or the point where you can say politicians are blaming anything and everything on the Russians, right? Yeah. Like, that's the bogeyman now. We got, like, we, we have to, you know, be careful. And so, I mean, look, in, in public life, there are very intelligent people, there are maybe not so intelligent people, there are alarmists, there are people who say any number of things, and we don't gag people in, in, in public, in the public sphere. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So why would we do the same, why would we gag people in the virtual public sphere? I mean, it, 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 it is undemocratic. Like, look, I'm not gonna say that, like, if somebody goes on social media and advocates for genocide, or the killing of a particular group, or any number of atrocious things, Right, there are limits. Like you cannot allow people to say things that directly advocate for violence um, to any particularly any any particular marginal existing marginalized group. Yes, that should be shut down. That should be treated. But I mean, there are in many countries laws against that. So I mean, as long as a person's speech is is in with within the confines of you know decent or maybe that's too much, but as, how about this? Let me just say, as long as you're not advocating violence or any sort of despicable act, I think it would be unfair to just, because you are, to, to silence people, because it, then you're on a slippery slope. You know, like, this person's saying this, so let's shut them down. Oh yeah, we gotta shut them down too over there. 
you know, and then and then and then everybody's silenced. And then, but but then what ends up happening is those in power are the ones who get to decide who gets shut up, you know. So it, it's it's a fundamentally undemocratic losing proposition. So just very quickly, I, um, in, the, in the book that I did with Nolan Higdon for City Lights uh, this year, um, United States Distraction, Media Manipulation in Post-Truth America, and What We Can Do About It, <laughs> right? The last chapter is Make America Think Again. And so I agree with what Emil is saying here. And, and I think, again, our solutions to these kinds of, of challenges, right, is not to shut one down or another. It's to give the public the tools that they need to decipher it on their own, right? That's what freedom looks like, yeah. right? And then that that also, and then, and then of course what you all talk about is, is well, what's possible, right? When we, when we get into censorship and shutting things down, we start forgetting about the imagination about what could be possible. And so Nolan and I in this book talk about the five C's, what we need to bolster, civics education, critical thinking, critical awareness of media, community engagement, and cultural competence. Competency. And cultural competency also includes things like empathy and understanding. What drives people to say completely heinous and absurd things? But usually it's ego and self-interest and narcissism, right? Which is, a, which is an abstract form of violence, right? And so I think that when we advocate for things in, in the last chapter of the book here, um, you know, we, we not only talk about um, you know how to do those things, but we talk about how we stay informed in, in a digital world, right? And this is where this is happening: these kinds of heinous statements. But the idea that we want to shut it down, I think, is is, is a slippery slope to much much larger problems. And Project Centered has long opposed uh, those approaches to that because censorship tends to backfire, uh, cause a lot of problems. We also talk about broadening news framing. We talk about rebuilding local and investigative journalism, right? Not top down, bottom up. Social media, in a lot of ways, masquerades as bottom up, but it's top down controlled, mm -hmm. right? So that's a real serious problem. We need more educational uh, news media, and I think we need to support wet whistleblowers and truth tellers at, at every turn. And again, build or boost those signals. Uh, don't just turn off others. Excuse me. Um, well, I don't know. I, I wanted to ask you guys this really basic question about RSS, but in case this is being recorded, just kind of throw in on what you guys were talking about. It needs to be said, and maybe it doesn't need to be said in this room. <clears throat> but I think there's an important distinction to make between censorship from uh, censoring your own community and government censorship. So, you know, I don't think Twitter is obligated to keep any kind of speech on their platform, for example. You know, because that's a community and the people who run Twitter, they get to say what kind of community they want to have. And you should always take these concepts about the digital world and think about them in the real world. Like if we were having a potluck and people started showing up and saying the kinds of things they show up, say on Twitter, like not only would they be kicked out, there would be a fist fight. So, you know, um, it's not a matter of, you know, oh, they're censoring that space, but that is their space and they can do with it as they please. Um, that's a totally different situation from the government where, you know, on the other hand, I will fight to the death for your right to say something I totally disagree with. Um, anyway, my real basic question was going to be about, <clears throat> excuse me, you talked about um, uh, bypassing, going around social media, and um, I was curious if you think RSS is still a potential venue for, um, like, can we blow RSS up? Can we get people engaged in that again? Because it seems like RSS was this really great solution for what social media seems to kind of latch onto and done, where you can follow things that you care about. But people tend to use Facebook and Twitter for that, so I'm just curious if you guys think there's still potential there. Good question. I wanted to say something else where I disagree. I don't believe Twitter is run by a community. It's a corporation and it's run top down. If it were run like a community and people using it got to decide what garbage they didn't want at their potluck, it would be vastly different than a top down corporate decision to ban certain things. Okay, so, but even if you have a top down, say a party that you're throwing, you're still responsible for that community. So that doesn't take away from their responsibility to monitor that. Anymore. Sure, but again, that opens the door for them to be able to get rid of anything that they say is ruining the party because they don't like coleslaw. Yeah, and um, I think you, they you have what I'm saying. So I just think it's a slippery slope, that's all I'm Fair gonna enough. say. But RSS, all, all day long, I think that <laughs> yes, 
We need to go back, as Emil said, with the email feed, sign up to those news places and get their direct material, yeah. support them directly, right? That I think that's exactly what we really need to be you know, rebuilding, because we already have that technology. Yeah. Uh, just super fast. Um, yeah, I think, like for instance, I, I generally keep my discourse on social media pretty polite. And for instance, I made a commentary on the police and somebody reported it and my post got taken down. So it wasn't a matter of like, I wasn't being polite, it's a matter of somebody just, wanted, somebody just didn't want to hear it. And I think, well, that's not fair. You know, and about RSS, I haven't used it in years. I used to, and I, I had so much news coming in, I was like, oh my god, I can't even handle this. Yeah. Um, and, and my Facebook feed, for instance, isn't like other people's. Like, people look at my Facebook feed, it's like academics, news organizations, like maybe a picture of a baby or two or a plate of food. But like, I kind of use my Facebook as a news feed, like literally news, like right. not junk. But, um, so I, actually, that's a good point that you bring up, like, you know, like, Direct, directly connecting to those sources of alternative news that you know and trust, uh, and, and getting it directly, and actually, I think I might do that. Yeah. So. <laughs> okay, I have a uh, yeah. uh, I'm from China too. <laughs> and, uh, I know the uh, corporate media is like uh, uh, NBC or New York Times. But I, I, I'm going to hear about the independent, independent media. So like the, the social media, like Twitter, Facebook. So. Are you asking what independent media yeah. is? Yeah, okay. Oh. So independent and alternative media are the things that you can find in a lot of our books. They're non-corporate. So they're either community run or they're privately run. It doesn't mean that they're necessarily quote objective. Oh. Right? But it means that their prime directive isn't turning profits. Right? Their prime directive is usually trying to get news out that feeds a certain community that's based on transparently sourced facts and evidence. Um, there may be a perspective that's driving it, right? but the corporate media masquerades as being objective when it clearly is not. Right, it is controlled in this country by about six corporations, 90% of it. Um, and so that goes through a whole bunch of these filters, right? And Chomsky and Herman talk about that in their, their propaganda model. We've updated that for the 21st century on the project website. But, uh, but if you're interested in, in more about in independent uh, media and press, you can check it out on the uh, projectcensor.org website because we have a whole list of those things and we actually talk about what that means and what they are. Yeah. Thank you so much. I, I would add on, on that question about independent media, I would add that um, the, the term corporate media is one that we at Project Censored started using to differentiate a, a terminology that is more commonplace. People talk about the mainstream media. And, and, and so like you would talk about, say, the TV network news programs or the Washington Post or the New York Times, as many people would call them the mainstream media. Uh, and the argument that we've advanced at Project Censored that was a, really initiated by Peter Phillips, who is a previous director of the project, was that it's misleading to call those outlets mainstream because they don't really represent a mainstream viewpoint. They represent a corporate viewpoint. And insofar as that, that corporate viewpoint is removed from the everyday lives of most people in the country, right, who aren't multimillionaires, who don't have huge uh, you know, uh, yearly bonuses as a result of whatever work they do, um, that that news isn't really representing mainstream interests, it's representing corporate interests. So we spend a lot of time in classrooms with our students talking about what's the difference between why do we want to call it corporate rather than mainstream news, and then how is independent news uh, an alternative to that? What makes, and it's very, those conversations can become very interesting because the first thing students will do, will they'll, they'll ask, well, is this an independent news outlet? Is this one a corporate? Yeah. Okay. And, that, and sometimes the answers are very clear and, and, and obvious. Sometimes they're not. And, though, and when they're not, those conversations end up, I think, being very educational, very instructive, because then you are start having to, act, having to explain or talk about what makes something a corporate news outlet. So one example, just really quickly, like years, I think if you go back to older Project Censored yearbooks, the Huffington Post is the source for a lot of stories in our annual top 25 list. The Huffington Post started as a truly independent news organization. 
Um, but it was at, at some, I think, what, around 2014? At some point it was acquired, mm -hmm. and, and, and it, 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 the business ownership of that entity changed, and you can see mm -hmm. almost, it's all, not quite a watershed, but it's almost like a watershed. You can see the content of that news organization changing as the corporate ownership changed, as it became a corporate news entity. Mm -hmm. And you can, you know, and so I think, you know, that's a nice kind of example where you, you have almost like the, the closest we're going to have to a controlled laboratory experiment where you can say, let's shift this variable and see what happens to the outcome. Okay. Huffington so, Post changes, so yeah. Um, so, do uh, you want to start? Or I think we, and we have about one minute. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> I'll, 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 uh, just thinking about uh, what the news looks like in the future and these uh, the cross platforms that, you know, since we've become not just digital, there's still newspapers, there, there are local sources. What we left out, I think, in part, and where part of the truth of our message comes is that local news is very important. Mm -hmm. And uh, communities actually create their own news. Mm -hmm. This is why this, this network that Amber was talking about is so fascinating. Mm -hmm. Like seeing successes that are happening out there in local places that are, might be modeled elsewhere, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, just communities, again, creating their own news and really being an active part of this with these platforms. And how do we talk about creativity and, and creative thought, not just critical thought? Mm -hmm. You know, and they're very two different ways of thinking, extremely different. And, and one relies on trust. Well, what do we trust, right? And, and, and showing that there's good, credible reasons and good, critical reasons why we can trust this source. And now but we also have to be open and connected and feel the security of that. And where does that fit in this larger basket? It's still yet to be decided. Thanks so much. Uh, we have a wonderful discussion. And thank you to each other. Yeah. I will put in a quick plug. Uh, if you're interested in more on these themes, the roundtable uh, discussion at lunch today at 1230 will feature not only uh, Mickey Huff, but also uh, Steve Masick, Robin Anderson, and Nolan Higdon uh, talking about Trump, the media, and America's truth emergency. And then later this afternoon, if I may, uh, uh, at uh, what time is that panel? At 2 o'clock, I will be on a panel with April Anderson talking about news coverage of LGBTQ issues uh, based on a chapter that is published in this year's book. So there are other, and, and that I won't uh, take more time now to talk about tomorrow's program, but just later today, uh, if the themes that we've you've heard uh, uh, being discussed uh, this morning have engaged you. There's more on the program uh, later today uh, that will extend those conversations, I think. So thank you again for coming. Thank you to the panelists for a wonderful presentation, set of presentations. And uh, yeah, thank we're you. done.